If you are able to appreciate comedy and make the odd witticism and come across as a kind of, you know, as affable and open and, dare I say it, occasionally amusing, I think it definitely helps your ability as a leader to get people to commit to what you want them to do and to, if you like, whether they're leaders or also followers and to kind of follow the vision and to um, do the best they can. So I think um, it, it's a pretty crucial uh, quality for any leader. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport and entertainment who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a legendary lifer in the delightful charity Comic Relief, where he served as chief executive for 19 years. He is the creative mind behind the iconic Sports Relief and Make Poverty History, in addition to organising almost two decades worth of the internationally celebrated Red Nose Day. He was appointed Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2016 and was named as Honorary Lifetime President by Comic Relief for the career he built combining comedy and caring. More importantly, his work has inspired hours and hours of laughter and saved many lives by motivating masses of people to be funny for money. Kevin Carhill, welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Uh, thank you for that, and I'm happy to be here. Well, it's a real pleasure to see you again. It's been a while since I've seen you, and, and I know that you've done so much astounding work. Um, your extraordinary career centred around tapping the power of comedy to change lives. Now, the Jesuits say, give me a child of seven and I will give you the man. Was the young Kevin Carhill aware that comedy was a potentially powerful tool. It depends how, you, how young you're going when you say it was the young. I, I, I certainly wasn't at birth. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I've probably been someone who has enjoyed comedy and come across it, but uh, it was certainly um, just haphazard and, and a stroke of luck that I ended up at an organisation called Comic Relief. And, uh, and the power of comedy to change lives and to make extraordinary things happen only really resonated with me properly once I stepped through the portals of that uh, uh, organisation and began, if you like, living it on a day-to-day -day basis, really, yeah. Was, well, come back to Comic Relief because it's such a hugely important part of your life, but was humour valued in your family when you were growing up? Um, well, I, can't, I, I had a you know pretty traditional working class background, Irish father who married and kind of met a, a young English woman during the war when the Irish came to the to the UK to run the factories while the, while the British men went to war and um, and so as such it was I, I'd say we managed to have a laugh but it wasn't particularly celebrated and I guess the the only manifestation of it would be probably the time we spent together watching television where Morecambe and Wise were on television, you know, Des O'Connor, Dave Allen. So, so we, we consumed that together as a small family, but really life was, was about generally getting by and, and surviving um, in, a t in a tough world as well. So, um, so I would say that I don't think either of my parents were particularly funny. They didn't tell jokes, but, but we did manage to have a laugh at times by, you know, just as, as most ordinary families would, yeah. 
that's really interesting because you talk about, you know, a reasonably tough upbringing and, and most of the time spent concentrating on surviving. Um, you've helped disadvantaged people in both the UK and some of the poorest communities around the world. Do you think that humour is more abundant in those poorer communities as a necessity? Well, I tell you, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't claim to, if you like, be an expert on how necessary it is. And I think all communities have their ability to laugh and the things that make them laugh. But I tell you what's interesting, that just um, I, I do think certain types of humour, if you take slapstick or uh, generally work in most cultural contexts and, uh, and for most communities and, uh, and most people. There's a difference, I think, between wordplay and witticism and ironic observation and slapstick. And so humour, I'm sure plenty of your guests on this uh, podcast would have talked about these type of things. But, um, but I think, he, he, I think every, sit, every community has ways of laughing and that situations that crop up and occur that are, are funny. I mean, I, I was just thinking that when Richard Curtis, who got me to go to Comic Relief, um, he tells this story, uh, which is probably relevant to this little strand of the conversation, about when he, he'd had the idea after Live Aid that the comedians might be able to do something similar to the musicians and the musical community um, uh, and make a difference. So he went on a, a fact-finding trip to, uh, to Ethiopia because it was post the 1984 famine. And he'd ended up in a refugee camp in the Sudan, just across the Ethiopian border. Uh, and what was happening there was there were three tents where sick children were being triaged. So there was one tent where the kids who had little chance of getting through it were being looked after, a middle tent where they had kind of reasonable chance, and then the third tent where there was the best chance. And he, he, he recalls being in that medium tent, and there was this thing that we used to, Lenny Henry used to call the flying pants. It was a way of weighing a small child by putting them in these pants that were on a kind of scale and you could you could get their body weight. And the, this particularly uh, um, emaciated young boy was put in there and he was so tiny that he fell through uh, and landed on the floor and started crying. And Richard was then kind of with his western kind of sensibilities thinking oh what a terrible thing and all the women in the tent burst out laughing uh, and um so it was an immensely tragic situation where a moment of slapstick brought out the humor and made everyone laugh and i tell that story because richard says that's the moment he realized this thing called comic relief could exist because actually it was comedy in the face of terrible tragedy and the two are able to sit if you like, side by side. So, so I, I, I suppose the point I'm making is that the, you know, slapstick can be funny for all kinds of people, and it can occur in any situation and break the mood and the tension, or make kind of tragic things ha happier, just even if it's for a fleeting moment. So, uh, I've never forgotten that story. No, and it's it's a, such a powerful story, isn't it? And uh, I, when you see the kind of suffering that you and Richard Curtis and all the comic relief people have, have seen that suffering close up, do you think that that humour actually aids resilience for those people? That laughing at the situation which you can't do anything is part of uh, evading that resilience? Uh, I'm sure laughter could always aid resilience. I mean, I wouldn't be, if you like, so presumptuous to speak on, on people's behalf with that, but certainly everywhere I've travelled, the, the people I've seen, the places I've been, um, uh, laughter is a great way of humanising, bringing people together and creating a sense of comradeship and empathy and, and solidarity. So I think it's one of the most powerful emotions in a way that can cut through anything and can and can also connect you with people who you, you wouldn't necessarily ostensibly on the surface of things feel an immediate connectivity with because of the difference in your cultural, economic and, you know, situations. But actually, humour can cut through and um, make things work. So you're talking about it, if I'm correct, and thinking in a, in a bonding way, that it's an automatic bonding tool. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I remember again a similar thing being being in um, in Ghana with or taking a football team to play, and the, so the sport and the football were bringing communities together. And Frank um, Skinner and David Badil were going to meet this community and to do some filming. And as and as Frank um, walked into the the hut we were going to film in, he bashed his head. Uh, and it was another piece of slapstick. And then uh, all the women in the room, because it, it was a woman's project we were visiting, again burst out laughing. And, and that broke the ice immediately because there was a kind of tension pre-recording. So, well, how's it going to go? Is it going to develop its own momentum? Will it work for everybody involved? And that just kind of, uh, you know, Frank reacting to banging his head. Right? And the people went, oh, well, these guys are OK, because... You know, they bang their heads like us, and so it's funny. Yeah. Well, that's it. it. It's one of the few things in the world that everybody can relate to, isn't it? It's a simple uh, sort of um, hands across the ocean, if you like, of a, a thing we understand. Um, you know, somebody falls over, somebody bangs their head. It's funny as long as the person takes it well. And of course, if the person takes it well, which I know Frank would have done, it, it takes it well and laughs at himself. That also eases the tension, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I, I, it's on a similar note, I'm going to put my glasses on here. We were with a group and um, introducing ourselves to, uh, in, in the middle of the the, um, the the north of Kenya with a community. And he came around to Steve Coogan and Steve Coogan, they said, well, um, and he went, uh, <laughs> my name's Steve Coogan, I'm a comedian. Uh, and uh, for those of people listening to this on audio, he just ad adjusted the alignment of his glasses so they fitted a skew across his face. And as simple a gesture as that, as I've just done uh, by adjusting my glasses, uh, actually had everybody laughing. So some people are blessed with, comedic instincts and creativity and can just do a little thing like that which which uh, provokes humor and then the humor brings people together so i think it's a fantastic tool for doing that would uh, you must intrinsically understand this because you have been around comedians and funny people but having to lead from the front i mean you led comic relief if i'm right from a 20 person startup to 300 staff and 100 million uh, a year income so is leadership enhanced by the ability to laugh the enhance uh, by the ability to allow humour to actually evolve in the business situation? Well, uh, um, it's interesting asking questions about leadership. I mean, I think that I've got my own views on it, and I think a leader needs all kinds of things, like a kind of a vision, integrity, and openness with people, the ability to own up to things that don't work well so that you can get things back on track. But I think also when people look at you as a person, your personality... Uh, uh, and um, uh, and the kind of man or woman you are, then if um, if you are able to appreciate comedy and make the odd witticism and come across as a kind of you know as affable and open and dare I say it occasionally amusing, I think it definitely helps your ability as a leader to get people to commit to what you want them to do. And to, if you like, whether our leaders are also followers and to kind of follow the vision and to um, do the best they can. So I think um, it, it's a pretty crucial uh, quality for any leader to be able to, I suppose, appreciate comedy and as far as their abilities allow. So in essence, do you think that the humour humanises uh, people and, and leaders need to to an extent, be humanised in order to connect and 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 without followers, the leader's just a bloke on his own. Yeah, a bloke or a woman on their own. But I think that... Yeah, that's, that's I, I true. Think that, um, I think essentially it, it kind of... It adds warmth and texture uh, to relationships and it helps people, therefore, feel comfortable in your company and uh, and also to kind of b believe in you more and, and therefore uh, can develop a kind of loyalty uh, and a, a level of support that you wouldn't get without it. 
Yeah. So I think we're talking about the, whether that leader is male or female, a rapport yeah. that it, yeah. it, it helps to oil the wheels of business, as it were. And, and if you haven't got rapport with people, I think it is harder as psychologists to get people to, to follow you and follow where you, your vision it is. And of course, you mentioned the time I spent, uh, which was a great time running Comic Relief. But of course, if your company's name is Comic Relief, then it stands to reason that uh, comedy or comic bit of it is, is going to be important, isn't it? Because actually comedy was our operating sphere. It was the thing that made us stand out. So Comic Relief sums, sums it all up. And we, we were lucky. Personally, I was lucky because I'm not... Um, particularly comedic myself but um but i had the pleasure and the privilege of working with people for whom comedy was their kind of professional metier and who relied on it for their career and their support and the millions of people who laughed at their jokes or the work that they did so um it was um, in that respect it was fantastic well i i'm interested because you said that it, i'm not particularly comedic myself but the whole humorology project is not just about making jokes and getting doing gags it is about um the having the humility it's about having the ability to humanize people to let humor flow and sometimes um, the most important person is somebody who allows humour to happen, who leads from the top, who lets it happen, isn't it? Can you talk a little bit about that thing of of allowing it rather than... You, you, I don't think you have to be. I think you. one of the things you can do to really aid humour is to be a good audience. Basically, people spend a lot of time at work and... Um depending on what their job is, it could be eight hours a day, it could be up to 12 hours a day or whatever. And I certainly used to say to the, the, to the new beginners of Comic Relief that in, in a sense, because they're spending such a huge amount of their life, then in the office, I mean, now it's a bit different because people are working from home, uh, and uh, that, that in a sense it was their responsibility as well to en enjoy being there, to... Have fun. I mean, uh, having fun at work was as important in some ways as the crucial nature of the work. Because if you're in, in, a, in a workplace where you're bonding with people, you're having a laugh and you're kind of enjoying what you're doing, then as far as the company or organization is concerned, they're going to benefit from that kind of vibe and that atmosphere. And so I was always, you know, if you like, determined to let people laugh, have fun, enjoy the fact that they were working in a community where that was allowed and they could actually relax and chill and uh, enjoy downtime as well as the, the critical work that they're engaged to do. But you mentioned that um, there was a point at which the organisation was raising £100 million a year. That's not an easy thing to do. It's a very pressurised environment um, and rising to the challenge of it can be quite demanding and ask a lot of people. Therefore, you need that ability to, to kind of debunk it a bit and to enjoy it and to, to tell jokes, have fun with your colleagues in order for the community of it to work in the most efficient and productive way to deliver the best results. So I'd say that comedy or humour and humorology, as you call it, is, is critical in that sphere. I, I think you're 100 percent right. And it's lovely to hear somebody who has led such a big operation talk in those terms, because a, a lot of our listeners will be not comedians in business, in uh, areas. And actually, I think everybody needs to know that it adds to the bottom line. That, I mean, if people have a real purpose, if they're happy at their work, if they if they feel that they can have a laugh with people, they are going to be ultimately happier and more productive. Yeah, and I think that I was thinking as we came into this uh, of moments, I used to work at the National Theatre before I went to Comic Relief, and we I used to produce small-scale tours, and we were going around the country and having to just get the, the packaging and the equipment right to take some actors overseas, and we'd bought these massive bags to see if, if we could get all the equipment and the costumes and stuff in them. And I remember that um, 
one of one of the my friends from then who was working with me um basically we were trying to test out the the load bearing capacity of this bag so i persuaded her to get in it um uh, and she climbed into this bag it was a soft bag not a suitcase and it had a zip and so i zipped it up so her head and neck was sticking out of the top and um as chance would have it, it was the first week that Richard Eyre had taken on the job of being the director. I'd taken over from Peter Hall as the director of the National Theatre. And he happened to be doing a walk around saying hello to people at the moment when I was carrying this bag around the office with one of the team in the bag with her head, if you like, sticking out. And... Um, and we just had to tough it out, you know, to pretend it was like an everyday occurrence and activity. And uh, it w was quite proper, really, that we were, we were low testing this luggage. And, uh, and um, to give Richard his due, he went along with it. But he could have left that room thinking, what a bunch of idiots, you know. This is what I've walked into with kind of people like that working for me. But it, it, we, it broke the ice. It made him kind of understand that there were... Um, you know, people who had a sense of humour in his team and we went from strength to strength and all got on with him and, you know, the rest is history. So so that was just a moment when humour broke the spell, but it was a kind of like just just something I remember fondly, actually. Yeah. Well, is, uh, isn't that because, you know, there's a saying that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Yes, and yeah. actually... That first impression still sticks with you with Richard Eyre from, uh, from those days at the National Theatre. And it could have gone completely the other way. If, if, if Richard Eyre had suddenly gone, uh, well, what the hell do you think you're doing? I pay you to, to do this. But what a, I mean, I actually think that's incre incredibly wise to actually go to those places and go, it's a bit of fun this should be encouraged. I think that uh, any business can get better if they do have that lightness in there, because it, I don't think it, it detracts from the seriousness. You, I think, have proved, and, and one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you, is that you can take the most serious things in the world, which are, you know, a poverty and, you know, with through making poverty history and sports history, and add a lightness of touch and they sit comfortably together because it's, it's for a good reason. Yes. And we used to say, and <clears throat> make the claim a bit that Comic Relief helped put the fun into fundraising. If you look at fundraising, in the period, if you like, before it existed. I, I think it, there was a, a greater kind of seriousness about it. It was perhaps about guilt trips and feeling guilty about doing things or doing things for, you know, uh, for quite kind of serious reasons. And then when you suddenly have things where people are kind of shaving their beards off for comic relief or sitting in the bath of baked beans, or what, which is kind of slightly ridiculous, all of it, but, it, but we basically said to the British people, think of the, you know, most eccentric and amusing and and wacky things that you, although I hate the word wacky, but wacky things that you can. And, um, and, and you know, put them on display and ask your mates and family to kind of, as, as in return for you making a fool of yourself, uh, to give you some money. And that money then will be used for a, a serious purpose. So I think that notion that, fundraising can be fun uh, was in some ways born with the very early comic relief because prior to that it hadn't really been a feature of the fundraising landscape and if you look at the fundraising landscape now it's happening everywhere and with all different kinds of people and communities and so but but certainly the fun elements of it encouraged the giving and the, the charitable aspect and so they went hand in hand and um and as a result, it's been an enormous success story. But I actually think that you also did business a huge favour because you allowed, maybe it's just that one day a year when, you know, because suddenly you saw businesses, you know, having, you can come dressed as anything you want in the business. It, it created a lightness in the workplace as well. And you allowed that to happen. 
and and so I think you probably changed the course of business as well, well it's by possible. doing it. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, there is certainly the the Lord of Misrule takes over on on, on that day. I mean, and uh, or it, it did. It was obviously, as we just said, it was relatively innovative and new. But when you hear stories of you know chief executives taking the the tea trolley around the offices and uh, you know job swapping and role swapping and teachers in schools becoming the pupils and the pupils becoming the teachers and all all of those things it does it, it it's just a kind of moment where we say well normal rules are suspended and let's see a different side of each other and it can humanize the managers and the bosses who can show that they've got a sense of humor and that they're prepared to fall in with a joke and it can you know make the teams feel motivated and um, and kind of warmer towards the company because of those things that have happened. I remember Justin King, who was the chief executive of, um, of Sainsbury's, who we did a big multi-year deal with to be the purveyors of the Red Nose and to help us promote Red Nose Day. And boy, did they do a brilliant job. But um, in, in talking to Justin about the rationale and the reasons why they made the choice to strike up the partnership in the way that they did. The first reason they often quote or he quoted was more to do with his team, but they're called colleagues at Sainz's, but the impact it had on the staff team and and the staff team's sense of the company uh, and their kind of, um, you know, feeling proud and passionate about the good work that was being done with the money that they'd helped to raise over the tills and through their own fundraising activities. And so that bringing of the sense of fun into a serious world of work for a limited period, you can't do it 365 days a year, but uh, but on the days when it happens, it certainly, I think, brings senior management and, 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 and teams together in a set, joint sense of purpose but the thing that held it together was a sense of comedy or fun or humour because it was all built around uh, humour. So um, I think you're right in that. Absolutely. I, I, I've just realised that maybe unconsciously uh, I've, I've, I've nicked your idea because uh, you said that Comic Relief put the fun into fundraising. And I said in my introduction that, that humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'd like to thank you for unconsciously for giving me that yeah. line. You'll be hearing from my solicitors later. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair cop, society's yeah. to blame. What makes you laugh, Kevin? If you'd asked me that two months ago, I'd give you a different answer to, to today. But um, we have recently acquired a puppy called Veronica Merrylegs Bucket Barker, or Ronnie Barker <laughs> in short. Oh. And she's a little kind of Jack Russell cross. And I have to tell you, this dog has like had us hooting with laughter in this household just because of the behaviour of a puppy running around. You when you go out and come back, and they go, "Oh, they're back! Oh, yeah, where have you been? I've just been waiting for you." Like just be welcoming you at the door, stealing shoes and hiding them. You can't find things that were there, you know, half an hour ago, and you're rushing to go out. So, so currently in my life, this little thing, which is just kind of five months old is making us laugh our socks off. Actually, she's taking our socks off and hiding them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's the thing that's making me laugh most at the moment, just the joy of a little kind of creature coming into the household. Uh, and then obviously other things, that a great sitcom. I mean, Richard, you, Richard used to say that um, there are two great sitcoms every decade, but certainly I was, I was working in Sweden when Faulty Towers came out, so I missed the initial broadcast of it. And then when I did see it, there were moments where I had to switch the television off because I thought I was going to have a heart attack laughing so, laughing so much. So great sitcoms, great stand-up. I mean, Victoria Wood, as a stand-up, you just couldn't beat. And so, you know, you can find humour and laughter everywhere, but... Um, Currently, it's a five-month-old puppy called Veronica Merrylegs Bucket Barker. Tell me a true funny story about something that's happened to you. OK, here we go. Uh, I, um, I was uh, on a couple of days break in Stockholm. I'd gone, you know, for just for a long weekend or something. I was in a museum there. Uh, and um, But still, as this is the modern way, 
working as I went on my mobile and a message came in about something I've been working on for a good few months, which was actually to do with Clarence House and the who were then the young princes. I mean, they they were probably in their early 20s. And um, and I've been trying to get them to do something for sport relief. We were very, very close to it. So the thing came in that said, unfortunately, this is one of my staff team. Unfortunately, having considered it fully, I've had this email that says, we're sorry on this occasion. Um, we're not going to be able to get involved. Yeah. And I was always a very determined person when I was trying to get people to do things, usually for nothing. Uh, and so I pinged off a reply and said, and excuse the French, fucking typical, uh, you know, all mouth and no trousers. What are we going to do now? You know, and it was a fairly robust thing to my <laughs> assistant. But I'd done that terrible thing of pressing co copy everybody. And so the message had gone to the team at Clarence House. And the moment it had gone, I'm just going, oh my God, what? Like, this is it. It's just ruined my career. There goes my CBE. Luckily, I got it later. But, um, and uh, my knighthood. And um, so you just left there standing in this kind of quiet place thinking, what, what can I do? Because uh, in those days, there was a thing where, if you remember, where you could try and recall an email. I don't think it ever yes. worked. No, I don't, I don't think, think so. you can do it now. And so, I, so like an hour later, I thought I, I better, so I sent a thing to Clarence House saying, look, I'm really sorry. Uh, it's just that I was so frustrated, just kind of, my frustration got the better of me and I've pinged this reply up. I'm sure you've seen it and read it and uh, all I can do is apologise. And, um, and luckily for them, they came back and this will play to your your themes here. And they said, we've been pissing ourselves laughing for the last hour in the office because <laughs> we realised what a tragic mistake it was and uh, we wondered how you were going to deal with it. So don't worry. Yeah. Oh, whatever. That's so so lovely that there is a denouement in the story, where, which was actually that it it's a good thing. But also, there's there's something uh, from a psychological perspective, owning up and just putting your hand up and going. Well, I, I couldn't see any other way out of it. Just say I better take it on the chin and take it before he confessed it too long, because it was certainly a classic mistake. So. You've worked with all these extraordinary uh, comedians from all over the world over the years. Is everyone potentially funny or is it a gift given to the few? Well, uh, I think it depends on the gradation of it. But I think to be supremely funny and have the ability to make millions of people laugh is a gift that is... Um, restricted to the few, because it's a definite skill. There's different bits of people's brains that are probably developed in a way that lend themselves to that. And even within that, people are funny in different ways. So I, I, so I don't think everybody is funny, um, but I think there is humour in situations that everybody finds themselves in. And sometimes they only feel funny in retrospect, you know, it's whether how... I'm a person who doesn't deal very well with practical jokes. Uh, and uh, I remember a couple of situations where I, uh, friends putting kind of fart powder in a curry that I was eating once, but uh, and uh, tragically it didn't sink into the curry. So it was like sitting on the top, they distracted. And I'm looking at this little yellow stuff and thinking what that, everyone at the table is pissing themselves laughing because the joke was going to be on me. And... Um, and so I didn't find it fun. I didn't find it funny at all. But as I tell you this little story now, it's hilarious because you know, in on reflection, it was it was funny. I remember going for like a skinny dip years ago with my partner Becky, and we and um, the family took our clothes off in the car and drove away, and we were left on this kind of <laughs> this this kind of this lakeside in the south of France. Stark bollock naked, you know, and I have to say, I didn't find that funny. Um, but actually, again, as I recount the story to you, it's something I've remembered in my life because 
to then it was totally hilarious and the, he comes up every now and then to family events where I remember the time when we so so actually I think there's humor in situations uh, even though everybody isn't naturally funny I think the very funny uh, are gifted I think they go they get to places that us mere human beings can't get to in their scripting and performance and stuff but it's um but I think it is a gift to be genuinely funny. So do you think it's essentially a superpower at that point where, whereby the, the neural pathways are yeah. so quick that they can do it? Because, you know, we both know a, a, a lot of comedians and there's something I, I always liken it to um, a really good sports person, or, you know, like a footballer who, who when they describe um they have lots of time when the ball comes to them. It's like it's in slow yeah. motion for them. And I always think that comedians, the really good ones, it is kind of like time slows down and they they yeah. see loads of different routes that would be fun and see the funny bit. And look, anyone who was lucky enough to see Robin Williams, when I saw him in the West End and he did this thing, it's probably a shtick that he does all the time, so even though it's felt kind of random and improvised, but he came back after the final encore once the house lights came on and just did this thing where he said, someone give me a word, and people, someone in the audience suggested a word or a thought or a phrase. And he just basically went off on one and he riffed on that. And he, uh, uh, in that 30 minutes extracurricular performance at the end of the show, you could see he had the most amazing imagination and, and fluency and um, was an extraordinary, extraordinary human being. And so I think it is, a, for people like that, it is a superpower. It's just something that marks them out from them. And thank goodness, goodness for it, because actually we get the pleasure from seeing them perform and do that, you know. Yeah, but but just so our listeners aren't completely put off, you know, that this is um, just a gift from God and everything. I, I, as from a psychological perspective, I believe that people can get better at this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, there are ways on doing it. Having been surrounded by comedians, do you think you got, you maybe consciously or unconsciously got better at spotting where the funny is well i'd like to think so but it's not necessarily made me any funnier but i i guess the kind of the areas where i can manage it a bit are around awful puns or witticisms or incongruities and so is that or if you like observations of funny things that happen so that i i that, that's the only area in which i would give give myself credit or walking into glass doors and bashing my nose in the door, not having seen that there was a glass door there in the first place. I mean, I've been good at that over the years and uh, not nearly knocking myself out, but I, I wouldn't claim any kind of conscious involvement in that. It was just a terrible piece of slapstick. What would the world be like without humour, Kevin? In terms of your own well-being and sense of self, if you can, if you can, if you can laugh out loud and enjoy, enjoy things, that the endomorphins it, it kind of releases and things like that uh, do, I think, first of all, make you feel better about yourself. You, If you have a good laugh with somebody, and that's what everyone loves to do with their friends or their family, it's the, the most amazing just feeling. So that's the first thing. I think the, the second thing is that just this ability to connect people and to humanise us. And because we've talked uh, quite a bit about slapstick and things that have worked on that level, but it, it brings people together. So I think, um, I mean, I know someone saying that money makes the world go around. It was in Cabaret, wasn't it? But uh, yeah. I'd say for me, I'd replace money with laughter and humour that makes the world go around. I think it's a more powerful engine. I think that is such a wonderful point is like that laughter does make the world go round because you can have all the money in the world but you may not have the, the laughs it's it's about I think it's about connection 
because um, there was a very interesting study in America where they thought that they'd found the healthiest place in America because they lived 17 years longer than anywhere else. And they thought they probably didn't smoke, didn't drink and ate healthy. When they got there, they all drank, smoked and ate fatty foods. But what they had was a sense of community. Yeah. A sense of togetherness, a sense of laughing together and bonding together. And actually, that was what the, they discovered. Uh, the social scientists discovered actually brought longevity on. And like you said, the endorphins, the serotonin, the dopamine, the oxytocin yeah. that's produced, that is life enhancing and laughter is life enhancing. Yeah, and there's that, is it the book called The Spirit Level? You might have come across it, but it argues that the richest communities in the world are often the most unhappy because actually it's uh, I mean it's the age old cliche that money can't buy you happiness but, uh, but because if people who gather together in those communities then feel they need a different level of security and protection they can't just walk out onto the street on you know and they have to be driven everywhere so I think there, there is a, a lot of sense in that really so it's a and uh, uh, and the countries where the gap between the richest and the poorest is the narrowest, and they often point to countries like Norway, uh, where people are are happier because uh, the sense that sense of inequality isn't as pronounced as in other other places. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I work in Norway a lot, and I agree that there's there's something about that e equality of life where everybody it does lift everybody up. Because they, they, nobody feels downtrodden, perhaps, but and they do laugh easily. The Norwegians. If I asked you to write a business case for humour, what would you put in it, Kevin? Well, again, based on my own experience of running a large organisation, I think that um, because, as we were just saying, if humour can drive a sense of well-being, a sense of kind of uh, uh, happiness. So, it can connect people, and I think if um, the the more humour and um, connectivity there is in the work workplace as a result of it, the harder people are likely to work, the more productive they're likely to be, and the better benefits it's going to bring to the to the business as a whole. So I would argue that a happier, well motivated, fun loving community is going to be you know, better set against the bottom line as one where people are a bit, a little bit downtrodden, a bit unhappy, don't feel motivated and uh, don't have that same sense of well-being that's brought about by humour. So uh, that's what I'd say. That's how I begin to make the business case. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a huge return on investment, isn't it, really, for people, if, if they're thinking about why should they do it? Well, people are motivated, people, less sick days, less, you know, um, um, issues with mental health. I think businesses think, don't think enough about the human level that we are dealing with lots of individuals who have needs. And, yeah. and one, of, one of the first things is a need to belong. Yeah. And so if you're, if, if you're running that company or near part of the senior management team, I think it's incumbent on you to try and create the culture and atmosphere where people can feel they belong, where their achievements get um, celebrated and mentioned and talked about. But at the same time, if people underperform in any way, so you have, you have techniques and mechanisms to deal with that underperformance because people need to know what their job is, what the brief is and what's expected of them. So I think clarity of communication and setting of realistic targets which then can be celebrated when they're achieved and make people feel better is critical, really. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you've spent years persuading celebrities to undertake grueling physical challenges. Yeah. Uh, how important is humour in the art of persuasion, do you think? What I'd say is, depending on a lot depends on who you're talking to and what they're how up for things they are, you know? So I, I, it was interesting when David Williams um, swam the channel for comic relief, sport relief, um, and it was the first really of these mega challenges. So 
actually, I think I'd argue that it established a new genre that's been copied ever since by sort of flattery being, you know, the sincerest form of uh, imitation being the sincerest form of flattery. Uh, but I'd gone to Ethiopia with um, with David uh, and Matt Lucas, who then, you know, Little Britain was at its height, actually. Uh, and on the way back on the airplane, I'd said to David, do you like sport? And he said, well, I hate sport. I was terrible at it at school and uh, just didn't like it at all. But the one thing I did like was swimming. And... Um, Actually, weirdly, I, the thought has occurred to me occasionally that I might try and swim the English Channel, at which point I said to him, you've just told the wrong person. So if you're thinking about humour, I said, because actually in three months' time, you're going to get a phone call from me, and I'm going to say, you remember you mentioned this kind of foolish idea that you might swim the Channel. Um, well, if, if you're serious about it, we can put the underpinning of it together, the logistics and the support mechanism, and we could try and get you across the channel. And he was, um, they were touring Little Britain live. So, um, and he said, yeah, let's try it then. And, um, and so what we started doing is wherever he was in the country, Bolton, Huddersfield, Sunderland, we would book book a lane in the local swimming baths at kind of eight o'clock the next morning after a show and he would diligently head down there and swim and swam for an hour swam for two hours swam for three and built up the endurance we had a great guy called greg white who was a, a kind of ex-olympian who was became a kind of mentor and consultant because he was swam in the pentathlon in the olympics of barcelona therefore was a great swimmer in his own right. And, um, and the, as I say, the rest is history. He was the first cross-dressing comedian uh, to swim the channel in under 10 hours. It put him in the top 50 of all time of having done it. And, um, and David will tell you now he's more famous for that than for anything else. And every time, if he gets in the London taxi, they kind of go, oh, David, been swimming lately. So that the, 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 everyone loves and celebrates the fact that he did that. And then subsequently, of course, he swam the River Thames from Letchley down to Westminster. But, but, um, but I, I, I mean, I'm surmising in retrospect, but I guess the ability to turn that kind of innocuous conversation into a kind of little humorous exchange might have played a role in, um, in his doing that. And he raised over a million pounds, and then when he swam... The Thames, I think it was three million, and uh, that money went on to do extraordinarily positive things in the lives of disadvantaged and vulnerable individuals and communities. So, um, yeah. Just from those little acorns of yeah. a little bit of humour and uh, persuasion, that massive influence, not just on um, uh, one person to swim, but on that influence that pervades your whole career, whereby all these um, people were affected by that. So just that alone is a reason to uh, improve. Not you, I always think of it as good humour. Improve, uh, be humorous yeah. rather than, uh, you know, and humorful and, and get that into your life because then you can persuade and you can influence and, and do great things for the world. We've reached a part of our show, Kevin, that we like to call quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. Who's the funniest business person you've met? This is an interesting question about funny business people because I've been lucky enough to visit hundreds of projects, if you like, uh, in the UK and the, and the developing world. And I've got a strong memory of... Um, I went to what, the Kibera slum in, um, in, in Nairobi, which was... Um, a million people, uh, a slum the same size as Bristol, but within it is this incredibly vibrant internal 
community because people need to get their hair cut, they need to buy clothes and sell clothes, get things clean, get food. And so uh, one of the things that you learn uh, early on when you make these visits is, that, is, is just how kind of alive and vibrant these informal settlements and, and poor communities are. But within that, uh, there was a woman called Sister Anne who uh, I'm referring to her as a businesswoman because she ran this charity, but it was the business of the charity. She had to bring in the resources and the money to help keep that community ticking over and to put food onto the plate and get medical attention for kids who needed it all, schools and lessons prepared and so on and so forth. And uh, and she, um, the reason she was funny is she just had the ability to kind of get things out of people. I remember being there and visiting her project with Russell Brown, who had a gorgeous kind of pair of probably brand new Timberland boots that he, he probably bought for the trip because he knew that he'd be doing some walking. And on the last day we were there, she, and the boots were got mud all over them because we'd been walking, it had been raining, and, and her saying to him, um, Look, his feet look the same size as her son's and weren't they gorgeous boots? And five minutes later, she had the boots off him and they were being kind of stashed away to hand over to her. his son. Another friend of mine went to see her and by the end of the visit, she committed to buying a new cooker and a fridge for the, uh, the you know, for the central community centre. So, so um, she was funny, not in the sense she was able to tell hilarious stories, but she was funny just because of the determination and the persuasive power she had to unlock things from people who were visiting, obviously from funders like Comic Relief, but of course all of, all the things that went back into that community helped to deliver a more sustainable lifestyle. And there was even one street there, which um, this is the canny individual she was, where through a micro credit program, people have been able to borrow money to buy initial stock of vegetables for a vegetable store, buy the equipment to do f fruit pressing so they could sell f fruit juice or, or the scissors and, and dryers for a hair salon. And so there was a street where a lot of the money that had come from the British public had helped establish small businesses, you know. And she, of course, named the street Red Nose Street. So whenever we went to visit, we were taken up Red Nose Street, made to feel... Well, that's great that you know there's a whole place here that's that we've been able to help facilitate through the imagination of this one woman, Sister Anne. And so I'd say, um, yeah. So that so she was the funniest business leader I've met, but for not perhaps for the reason one might normally have uh, thought about it. That's wonderful. It just makes me want to meet Sister Anne, really. And I, I know I'd turn my pockets inside out as soon as just because she sounds the most wonderfully uh, amusing and persuasive person. Wonderful story. What book makes you laugh, Kevin? Well, I've chosen the, there's a book, the Irish writer called Flann O'Brien, who was a columnist for the Irish Times who wrote this book, it was a short stories really, or pieces called Miles and Agopoline. And um, I would recommend it to anybody. I mean, basically it's, it's just these kind of flights of fantasy around, you know, moments. There's a story called A Horde of Unemployed Ventriloquists. And basically it describes going to the theater, the Abbey theater and the people um, because it, there were lots of social climbers in the audience, they wanted to appear witty and urbane and, you know, be the kind of, I, I suppose, the pinnacle of, of Dublin society. And so they would take a ventriloquist with them to the theatre, who would then be able to throw insults around the auditorium to other people in the theatre, but then those people had ventriloquists as well, who would then throw a return uh, uh, insult back. And it, it's just the most kind of extraordinary picture of this, this like thousand people in a theatre. What film makes you laugh? Well, I'm gonna have to say here, a film by one of my, my mentor and great colleagues and friends, uh, Richard Curtis. Uh, it would be Four Weddings and the Funeral. I mean, it was one of Richard's early ones. But I think he was at an age where he was in being invited to weddings most weeks. You know, you get to a certain age where all your 
mates in your network are getting married. And uh, uh, he tells the story that going to those weddings inspired him to write that book. And then, of course, threw in the funeral as a, as a little additional kind of free song. And then he also tells amusing stories about how he had to fight to get the title past the kind of the the backers and uh, uh, and the producers because uh, you know uh, uh, the title of a movie with the word funeral in it was wasn't necessarily and it was a romantic comedy going to be the kind of most winning title but he stuck to his guns and actually uh, the, it's, it's a play of words now that gets used in a lot of situations isn't it but so yeah for weddings and a funeral would be my choice out of both. The fact that it made me laugh out loud, but uh, also loyalty and solidarity with an old friend. Well, it is genius. It, it really is. Taking a shift to the other side, Kevin, what is not funny? Um, well, I think I'd say jokes that are at someone else's expense, uh, where the, which actually can be quite painful and... Uh, and difficult, uh, but but they might be done in all in all seriousness, not to you know, not to hurt somebody. But I think humour um, has that ability to wound and to upset as well. And then, of course, without getting you know, I think we're allowed to get a bit political on this. But I think yeah. lack of integrity, broken promises. I think I would observe in the age we're living in. But um, someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg, I mean, I'm, I'm personalising this now, but when seeing him in his privileged position in, in the House of Commons as the leader of the House, trying to duck out of responsibility and, um, and um, shift the blame or not step up to the plate when it's expected that that's what courage and bravery should make you do, I, I think that's not funny. I think also... Uh, Prime Minister's attempts to be funny are often just not funny enough. The way he ruffles his hair to give that kind of impression of a slightly tousled, witty, you know, man full of classical illusions. But I think most of the illusions would go over most people's heads. I mean, they certainly go over mine, a lot of them. And so I, so I think, you know, kind of false promises, a kind of lack of moral fibre and a lack of integrity around things that you should be doing because of the position you, you've been elected to in public life are desperately unfunny. Hear, hear. What word makes you laugh, Kevin? Well, this is, um, the word that makes me laugh is kerfuffle. It's used a lot in Little Britain. I mean, I'm not entirely sure what it means, except perhaps it means a bit of a fuss, but it's a hard word to say without thinking, wow, that's a funny word. So kerfuffle. Kerfuffle. It's a funny word. It's a funny word. Um, would you rather be considered clever or funny? Well, I'd hope that this question was non-binary, to coin a, a contemporary phrase, and that one is allowed to say they like to be both clever and funny. But I, I, I guess, sadly, I, I probably... I'd probably choose cleverer as a kind of, uh, as a, a way of living my life, but I would hate to think that that means uh, I, I couldn't also claim occasionally to be funny. And finally, Kevin, if you could only take one joke with you to a desert island, what would it be? Well, it is, this puts me on the spot because I'm not a comedian, but I'm about to try and tell a joke in public for the first time. But So here's the joke. Um, there's a piece of string, and a piece of string goes into a pub and says to the landlord, could I have a pint of lager, please? The landlord says, I'm really sorry, mate, but I don't, we don't serve string in here, so can you get out? A piece of string's really upset, uh, but likes this pub a lot, so he thinks he'll try it again. Goes into the pub the next week, says, can I have a pint of lager, please? And he said, I've told you, we don't serve string in here. Get out. Third time, lucky he hopes, the piece of string basically puts a loop around his middle, messes up the end of the string so he gets into lots of different fibres, goes into the pub. Uh, and the, the landlord says, 
aren't you that piece of string I've thrown out twice already? And he said, no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> beautiful and beautifully told for your first live telling of a joke on, on a show. Beautiful. Thank you. It's very generous of you. Oh, no, it was wonderful. It's very generous of you to have taken the time with us and our kerfuffle here at the Humorology Podcast. Thank you so much for your comedy and your caring, Kevin. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production. <laughs>